So take your Bible, stand with me please, as we read from Exodus chapter 20, and beginning with verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything else that is your neighbor's. Father, we bless you and praise you and thank you that in Christ alone all our hope, all our security, all of eternity rests. But we know that in Christ alone we are secure if we know him in the free pardon of sin. We thank you for your word. Pray, God, now that it will come alive unto our hearts, unto our understanding, and that, Father, you will touch us in a way in which we have never been touched before. On this New Year's Day of 2017, may this be a new day in our hearts and in our lives and in our families and in our church. Well, we pray these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Thank you. You be seated. We live in a day of relativism. That term, by definition, is the concept that points of view have no absolute truth or validity to them, but that they are subject to what a man thinks, to what a man feels, to what a man considers to be right in his own mind and in his own sight and in his own eyes. You see, relativism basically says this. I can have something that I believe is true and is absolute. You, on the other hand, might be able to look at the very same thing that I am saying is true and absolute and you might say that you believe that it is untrue and questionable. So we are on opposite ends of the spectrum. I'm saying that it is absolutely true. You're saying there's no way that it's true. And relativism says both of us are right. Doesn't make sense, does it? How can I believe the sky is blue and the grass is green? And you believe that the grass is blue and the sky is green and both of us be right at the same time. But that's what relativism teaches us. Today's mantra, today's word speak is if it feels good, do it. If 
it feels good, do it. And what they're basically saying there is not only that, but if it feels good, do it, and don't worry or don't be concerned about the consequences. This way, nobody's wrong. Everybody can be right at the same time. We can all do our own thing. We can all make different choices because in the long run, relativism says it really doesn't matter. You can have your own set of opinions and beliefs. I can have my own set of opinions and beliefs. And all of God's children can have all their own opinions and beliefs. And whether they crisscross as to whether we agree or we disagree, we can all be right at the same time and enjoy life as it is. You see, the bottom line to relativism says, as long as you're satisfied, hear me carefully, as long as you're satisfied, the rest of it makes no difference. Okay? As long as you're satisfied, nothing else matters. So, don't worry about how it affects others. Don't worry about whether or not somebody might get hurt by what you think or by what you do. Don't be concerned if other people disagree. Do your own thing and let somebody else worry about the results and the consequences. It's gotten to the point today in 2017 that even access to God and heaven have become relative. How do I know that? Because there are many people who are teaching and believing today that there are a number of ways to come to God. That there are a number of ways to get to heaven. That there are a number of ways that lead up to salvation. And you can go one direction, and you can go one direction, and you can go one direction, and I can go in some other complete different direction, and we're all eventually going to get to the same place. That's what's being taught today. <coughs> and I'm ashamed to say it in a lot of pulpits that's being taught today. The idea is, and you've heard this said a number of times, how can a loving God send anybody to heaven? Right? You've heard that. So As a matter of fact, it's even got to the point today that people are saying, how can you even be sure that there is a hell? <coughs> Maybe that's just a figment of somebody's imagination. Maybe that's just something that's been trumped up. Maybe that's not true at all. We hear it over and over and over again. Why can't we just all get along? Why can't people just be left alone to do their own thing? Why can't I or why can't you or why can't we just do what we want or do what makes us feel good. Maybe you've even thought that before. Well, let's take it to the extreme for just a minute. Let's suppose that what I really want to do and what's really going to make me feel good and happy and satisfied in life is to become an axe murderer. It's really going to make me feel fulfilled and satisfied and happy if I can kill people with an axe. So is that going to be all right? Are you good with that? Well, it's going to make me feel good. It's going to make me satisfied. What's the harm? I'm going to get a kick out of it. You say, and, and some of you are already doing it with your the vigorous nodding of your head or the shaking of your head. No. No, you can't do that. But shouldn't I be allowed, uh, under this premise, shouldn't I be allowed to do my own thing? As long as it makes me feel good? That's what relativism is teaching. You see, contrary to popular opinion and political correctness today, there must be some absolutes that are just that, absolute and non-negotiable. Are you hearing me? There has to be some things.
things today that are absolute and non-negotiable. And they all stem from the list of the first ten non-negotiables that the Lord gave to Moses and the nation of Israel over 3,500 years ago. All our laws, all our moral codes, all, the, all of the outworkings of man treating man with dignity and respect, all of them go right back to and can be pinned to irrevocably the Ten Commandments. They're right there on the board, right behind where you're sitting. We've got the church covenant on one side and the Ten Commandments posted on the other side. God gave these over 3,500 years ago and yet today in 2017 they're just as relevant as when they were written by the finger of God the first time God wrote. Now before looking at what they are, let's take a couple of minutes to notice what they are not. Okay? Follow me closely. These are not ten suggestions or ten a la carte's or ten warm and fuzzies. These aren't ten ideas or ten possibilities. They're called commandments because that is what Almighty God commanded and expected of His people to do. These are not things that they were given that they mulled over and thought about and decided, well, we'll keep a couple of these and we'll discard the rest. Every single one of these, and there are only ten, but every single one of these is of utmost importance and they were to be strictly adhered to and obeyed by Moses and the people of God and you and I today. You and I have got to understand something at the outset here. This needs to be chiseled in stone in our, in, on our hearts and in our heads. When God speaks, he always says what he means and he means what he says. Always. Without question. Okay? There might be times when you and I might talk or you might talk to somebody else and you might say, I'm not exactly sure I understood what she was saying. Or I'm not exactly sure that I, that I understood what he was talking about. But God always makes it plain. Absolutely plain. And you need to understand that God doesn't just talk because He enjoys hearing the sound of His own voice. God speaks because what He, what he says is not only important, it is the difference between life and death. Let me give you an example. In that day, in Moses' day, if you participated in false worship, you were stoned to death. If you committed murder, you were stoned to death. If you participated in adultery, you were stoned to death. Notice, if you will, you've got your Bible open to Exodus 20. Look at verse 18 for just a minute. We stopped at verse 17. But notice what the people said to Moses when God gave the Ten Commandments here on Mount Sinai. Notice verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Here's the idea. They're standing there, and when they see this happening, what do they do? They back up. Okay, they back up. Verse 19. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. You see, these people knew that God meant business. And they feared the Lord. They feared the Lord. That's why they backed up. 
That's why they told Moses, you talk to God and then you talk to us. But we don't want to talk to God face to face because we're afraid that we're going to die. My dear friend, we live in a time when it is high time that we get back to the knowledge of the fact that God still means business today with His people and that we should have reverential fear for Him just like they did 3,500 years ago. We got to the point today, and I don't mean, listen, I don't mean cowering over in the corner when I say this. Okay, I don't mean that we're over there in the corner and like, don't hit me, don't hit me, don't hit me. That's not the idea here. We're talking about having a reverential fear for God. And it's gotten to the point today that in many instances, in many homes, in many churches, within many lives of many hearts of many Christians, we don't have a fear of God anymore. We've gotten to the point today, we don't care what God thinks. We don't care what God says. We don't care how God feels. We don't care whether we break His heart or not. Okay? I'm going to do my thing. And, and even though we wouldn't say this out loud, the idea is I'm going to do my own thing and God can just deal with it. God can just deal with it. I've had it said to me so many times, it almost sickens me on my stomach. <coughs> that people will do something and then they'll say, but pastor, God understands. God understands. Yeah, but God understands. He understands that you're being disobedient and disrespectful. He understands that you don't care. Yeah, He understands. He understands a lot more than you give Him credit for. But it's not like God saying, oh, I understand. You go right on and do what you're going to do. That's not the point. <clears throat> We've gotten away today to our dismay and to our discredit from having a reverential fear of God in our hearts and in our churches. I go back to the, to the book of Acts when Ananias and Sapphira came to give their offering before God. You remember the story there in Acts? They had sold a piece of land for so much money. It doesn't tell us how much. But they had sold it for so much money and apparently they had made the promise that when they sold it, I'm just going to use the, the, the Bible doesn't say it, just so you'll understand. Let's say that they, they were going to sell it and they were going to give 50% of what they sold it to to the offering to God. Okay? So they made, the, they made the decision, they made the comment, when we sell this particular piece of property, we're going to give 50% of it to the work of the Lord. So they sold their particular piece of property, but rather than giving 50% of it, they gave something far less. We don't know what it is, but they gave something that was not what they had promised that they would give. And what happened? God killed them both. Ananias came in, and was asked, did you say that you'd sell your piece of property for such and such? And he said, yes. And Peter said, you've not lied unto men. You've lied unto God. And the Bible says, and with that, he fell over dead. And they carted him out. A little while later, his wife comes in. She's confronted with the same thing. And I've often wondered, I've often wondered what went through her heart in that moment before she died when, when she was confronted by Peter and when Peter looked at her and said the feet of the men who carried your husband out are standing outside the door getting ready to carry you out as well can you imagine I don't even know whether or not she had the time to say uh oh or not but she died and they carried them both out. And then I love what the King James said. Right after that it says, And great fear fell upon the church. I guess it did. <laughs> I guess it did. Great fear would fall upon Pleasant Grove, would it not? Yeah. If I confronted one of you and said, Hey, and you went... And, and, and the deacons took you out and then your wife came in and I talked to her and, and she went, 
Yeah, I guess you would be afraid. You would be afraid. Thank God that we live in a day of mercy and grace. Because the truth of the matter is, if He carted them out today like He carted them out then, you and I wouldn't be here today either. Amen? You know that's the truth. We wouldn't be here either. So thank God for His grace. Thank God for His grace. Now another thing that these Ten Commandments are not. They are not outdated, they're not outmoded, they're not irrelevant, they're not old-fashioned, they're not antiquated, and they're not useless. Why would you say that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Because people still worship other gods today. People still use the name of the Lord in vain today. People still misuse and, ab and abuse the Lord's day today. People still disobey their parents today. Why, why is this the case? Because people continue to commit murder. They continue to commit adultery. They continue to steal and lie and covet what other people have. While we think that we've lived in a world where we have progressed, some things still haven't changed. You see, people still have a nature that is broken by sin. And so we cannot be left to our own devices. For when we are, when we're left to our own devices, like our earthly father Adam, we will do the wrong thing. We will do the wrong thing. Why? Because there is a sin nature within us. We have been born with that within us. Adam sinned, and since Adam sinned, every other man has sinned in his heart. So man needs absolutes. Man needs non-negotiables. And God Almighty knew this. So He sits down these ten absolutes these ten non-negotiables, these ten specifics to give us boundaries. To give us, if you'll think of it in a driving perspective, to give us guardrails so that our lives don't plummet down into the abyss. He gives us these things not because He hates us, but just the exact opposite. Because He loves us. And He wants us to do what's right not what's wrong. So over the, over the next several weeks, we're going we're gonna to look at these Ten Commandments. We're going to examine them, and we're going to try to get a grasp on what it is that God is saying to us and what God is expecting from us as His children. The Ten Commandments fall readily within two sections. You can divide them, not right down the middle, but pretty close. 40, 60. Okay? The first four, the first four deal with man's relation to God. The final six deal with man's relation to his fellow man. In other words, the first four deal with my relationship to God. The last six deal with my relationship to you. You understand? Think of it this way. The first four, my relationship with God, are vertical in nature. Me to Him and Him to me. The last six are horizontal in nature. Me to you and you to me. And if you take the vertical and the horizontal you go back to what I've been teaching you for the last several weeks, you get a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament because the vertical and the horizontal intersect in the form and the fashion of a cross. Of a cross. So let's take a moment and begin looking. Now, don't, don't, as I said, said something to people. Wednesday.
denied. Don't uh, don't spaz out on me. We're not going to try to cover <coughs> nine of them today. Okay. Uh, you heard from Karen yet? Yes, she's on her way. She's on her way. Okay. So, see, you can breathe easier now. Okay. <laughs> if he had said she's still waiting, you would have said no. <laughs> <laughs> While these fall into two categories, these ten, I want you to understand, I'm going to give you the scripture, I'm not going to ask you to turn, but I'm going to give you the scripture and I'm going to read it to you. When the Lord Jesus Christ was here, he spoke concerning the ten commandments and he reduced them from ten down to two. And that's found in Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse 36, and listen to what Jesus said. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Think about it. What did I just tell you? The first four deal with our relationship to God. And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. That's what? That's our relationship. And then you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's our relationship with one another. Jesus condensed the ten down to two and said, these two, if you keep these two, the idea is, if you keep those two, you keep the other eight as well. Because they all fit in together. So with that said, let's take a moment and look at the first two. The first two. And you find that in Exodus chapter 20, beginning with the third verse. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Now believe it or not, there are people today who believe that this means that you can have a multiplicity of gods as long as Jehovah God or as long as the Lord God Almighty is first. But that's not what the true rendering is from the Hebrew, which is the original language of 98% of the Old Testament. The word there is better translated as the word besides rather than before. Okay? What God is actually saying here is, you shall have no other gods besides me. You shall have no other gods besides me. And notice, if you will, when you look there, the word gods is in the small case, little g. And the word me begins with a capital M. So, so God is talking about false gods when he uses the word gods there. And he's talking about himself when he uses the word me. You shall have no false gods, no idols. You shall have no other gods. You shall worship no other god but me. It's what God is actually saying. Okay? Notice, you still got your Bible open to Exodus chapter 20. Look back at verse 5. That first sentence there says, For I, the Lord your God, am a what? Jealous God. I am a jealous God. Listen to what Moses says about God in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. He says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. A jealous God. Now why would Moses say that in Deuteronomy 4, 24? And why would God say that in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5? You need to understand this, okay? I've told you before, and I'm not being cute. If you're taking notes, you need to write this down. If you're not taking notes, you need to write this down. This is that important, okay? Listen to me. 
Why would God say this? Because you, you are God's creation. You are God's masterpiece. And it is not His intention, nor is it His desire to share you with anyone or anything else. Amen. You are His masterpiece. You were created by divine design. And so he doesn't intend to share you with anybody or anything. Now, let's be honest. Many people think that by saying that, God's being unfair. That God's being unfair, God's being unreasonable, that God is demanding too much from us. So if that's the case, let me ask you another question. Isn't that how you want your marriage relationship to be? Isn't that how you want your spouse to be? What if, listen, what if, your, what if your husband or wife came up to you this afternoon? Okay, you're, you're home, you're... If you're a man, you're watching the football game. If you're a woman, you're sitting there watching the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> God help us. Anyway, I'll move on. Uh, but you're, 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 you know, you're watching television. And while you're watching television, your spouse walks in. And your spouse puts the television on mute or turns the television off altogether and looks at you and says, Look, I've been thinking about something and I've made a decision. I want you to know I don't have I don't have a problem. I think it's fine. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful if you'd like to start seeing other people. <laughs> because I want to start seeing other people. I, I, I want you to know I think it's great. I think it's absolutely acceptable. I don't have any problem with it. If you want to start sleeping around and have and being intimate with other people, uh, if your husband told you that or if your wife told you that. Okay, if they suddenly said to you, I want you to I want you to really consider being intimate with some other ladies if it's the man. Or I want you to I want you to consider becoming intimate with, with other men if it was the husband. How are you going to readily respond to that? Are you going to say, Sounds good, babe, turn the television back on. This is a football game. <laughs> now I have seen things. I saw something the other day on the, on the internet that came up. I didn't read the article, didn't want to. I thought it was a complete waste of time. It was talking about celebrities who were okay with open marriages. You know? I looked at that and I thought, gag me with a long stick. Okay? But, but, but put yourself in that place. If your spouse came to you today and said, Honey, it's fine. It's great. I'm good. You, you, just, you just have at it. Just, just whatever you want to do is fine. Would you be okay with that? No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You would think, He's lost his ever loving mind. I need to have him committed. Or shoot him. I'm not sure I need him. <laughs> might, might be a waste of a good bullet, but, but we won't go there yet. <laughs> but nobody in here in their right mind would say, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. I don't have a problem with it. We would say, absolutely not! And yet, and yet, we don't have a problem expecting God to be okay when we're out doing things and being involved in things as though we were not monogamous with God in our relationship. Am I getting through to anybody in here today but me? As the old black preacher said, are you picking up what I'm putting down? Are you getting it? Do you understand? This is serious business, friend. This is serious business. Because 
While we would not do that to our spouse and we would not want our spouse to do that to us, we're okay with doing it to God. And we expect God to be okay with it as well. Listen to me. God is not one of 20. God is not one of 10. God is not only, or God is not even one of two. He demands our faithfulness. He demands our monogamy. He demands our exclusivity to Him and to Him alone. Remember what I said. These are commands. These are not suggestions. The first command is, you shall have no other God before me. The second one dovetails it because that's the way God intended it. Because the second one says, you shall not make for yourself any, any graven. That's what the King James says. The New King James says, or carved image. <clears throat> In the days of Moses and, and, and Israel, they were surrounded by people who practiced what was called polytheistic religion. Polytheistic means that they worshipped a multiplicity, a multitude of gods. And many of these gods were carved out of uh, stone or were hewn out of wood and they literally bowed down and worshipped him. You remember the story of Jacob and Rachel and Leah? And when they got ready to leave and to go home, you remember what Rachel did? She gathered up her father's what? Household idols. And she hid them in the sack on the camel when she was riding. His, probably his wooden little statue that he bowed down and worshiped to and offered incense to. She gathered those up and took them with her. So that's what I'm talking about here. Now you might say, we don't have any of those things in our house. You know, we, we don't have a big elephant over in the corner that we worship. We don't have a Buddha that we bow down to. We don't have little, you know, things sitting around that we, you know, we bow down to and we offer a pinch of incense to. We don't do that. So so apparently, while I might have a problem with the first commandment, I, I'm pretty good to go with the second because I don't do those things. Well, yes and no. Because the idea here in the Hebrew, listen carefully, I'm almost through. The idea here in the Hebrew is this. The idea here in the Hebrew is this. Anything or anyone that takes the place of God in your life or mine is our idol. You hear me? Could be a soap opera. Could be, well, I'll get into that in just a minute. You may say, I don't have anything or anybody that is more important to me than God. I, I, God's first in my life. There, there is, there's no one, there's nothing that is more important to me than God. Well, how do you really define that? Basically by saying this. You need to consider the true focus here. And the true focus is this. Anything or anyone, you follow me? Anything or anyone who receives more of your time, your attention, your interests, and your affection, more so than God, has become your life. You got me? Anything or anyone that gets more of your time and more of your attention and more of your focus and more of your interest and more of your affection in God has become your idol. And listen as I close. It doesn't have to be anything inherently bad or wrong or wicked. Okay? It doesn't have to be anything bad or wrong or wicked. Listen, your idol could be your spouse. Your idol could be your children. Your idol could be your...
your boyfriend or your girlfriend. It could be your job, your home, your bank account, your hobbies, your activities, your sports teams, your soap opera. Whatever the case is. Listen, listen. They don't have to be wrong things to be the wrong things. You understand? They don't have to be wrong to be wrong. They could be a right thing in the wrong place and it's what? Wrong. Wrong. So anything that gets more of you Anything that gets more of you than God gets of you needs to be put in its correct place. And that is not, not before God. No excuses. No excuses. Well, Pastor, are you guilty? Or did you get a pass? No, I've already had to work through this myself. I've already had to work through this myself. I said just yesterday. Just yesterday. You know, I think I'm going to have to give up on some of my sports teams. Not because they're bad. Because they take my time and my attention and my focus on the God. That's not right. So in a minute, we're going to extend out the uh, invitation. God spoke to your heart. Whether you're a member of this church or whether you're here today as a guest, this altar is open to any and every person. And I don't know where you might be, but the first person that's going to be to this altar is going to be the pastor. Because like I said, God's already dealt with my heart. I definitely want to be a vessel that is fit for the master's use. And if there has to be things that have to be like riding down the car, riding down the road at 60 miles an hour with both windows down and I chuck one thing out this one and one thing out. And if I have to just keep getting rid of them until there's nothing else to do, so be it. I want God more than I want anything else. I want 2017 to be a year when I truly am in all every
presupposed reason of every defense that we could put up. And then, Lord, we'll just get real with you and allow you to do in us what only you can. May no one today walk away from here the same as when he or she entered this building. But we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 142 is our hymn of decision. There is a fountain filled with blood flowing from the man who remains. Sinners plunge beneath that flood through all their guilt and stuff. 142, you stand, God speaks, you come.